Following this year's American Independence Day, July 4th, many people ask just what it meant to be an American, and politics aside, it's probably a deeper question than most would realize. In this situation, we refer not to U.S. citizens, but the indigenous people of the world's second and third most recently inhabited continents, or at least the most widely accepted definition of the term indigenous, as there are some who actually believe in alternate scenarios for the populating of the American Americas, which we will be taking a closer and objective look at in today's video. Before we begin, however, I think we should all agree that the ancient genealogical history of the Americas should have absolutely no bearing on current American politics. After all, due to genetic drift and human evolution, the people we will be discussing today would most likely have looked very different from their modern descendants, so rather than using ambiguously defined terms like white or Asian, instead we'll be using more anthropologically accurate descriptors such as Northwestern or Eastern Eurasian, as we shall discuss later on. There is a plethora of evidence which some claim as proof of pre-Columbian contact or even settlement of the Americas with the Old World, other than the most widely accepted hypothesis of Siberian migration over the Bering Strait. And although the dates of this migration path vary widely, it is clear that the peopling of the Americas occurred in various waves, with the first wave occurring some 20 to 15,000 years ago, much older than was previously thought by most historians. This of course means that the gene pool of Native American Indians, or Amerindians as they are increasingly referred to, is far from uniform just as any other large group, with diversity exacerbated by the extreme area that the various Amerindian population clusters are spread out over. Although the Americas may not have the same genetic diversity as say the continent of Africa or Asia, it is still apparent by simple phenotypic observations that Amerindians from the Amazon are distinct from those in the Andes or in Mesa America or the Great Plains region or the Arctic, and there are various reasons behind these phenotypic and genetic variations. Some of these differences are the result of genetic drift and isolation, adapting to their new environments after thousands of years, such as the case for the Fuegian tribes on the far southern tip of the Americas, native to the island of Tierra del Fuego and the surrounding region. Being the closest land area on Earth to Antarctica, clearly Tierra del Fuego is one of the most inhospitably cold regions of South South America, and as I've discussed on this channel many times, they have some of the most extreme adaptations of any group in the world. When the Fuegian or Yaghan tribe was first discovered by European explorers, they were immediately noted for their extremely tall stature in comparison to their neighbors, and in fact the name for the nearby region of Patagonia actually has its etymological origins in the Spanish word Patagon, meaning giant. All this not to mention that the native Fuegians walked around with minimal clothing, often in the nude, even with freezing temperatures most of the year, while also swimming and fishing nude in the waters surrounding the island at temperatures where the average human would be dead from hypothermia in less than 20 minutes. However, by and large, the overwhelming majority of Native Americans from both the North and South belong to various branches of paternal haplogroup Q. As I've mentioned in my previous video on haplogroups, haplogroup Q is linked almost exclusively to Amerindian populations, including the Fuegians, Amazonians, Mayans, and Inuits in the far north. Although regional subclades divide most of these populations, with haplogroup Q believed to have originated in Central Asia tens of thousands of years ago, branching away from R. As one of the best clues linking back to their original homeland, haplogroup Q is still present in many areas of Central and North Asia today, although there is currently no confirmed or widely accepted hypothesis regarding the linkage of many of these Amerindian languages of the New World with those in the Old. However, as mentioned before, this was not the only wave of migration to have a strong genetic and linguistic impact on the Americas. A later wave of migration also crossing the Bering Strait is responsible for the Nadini subgroup of Amerindians located primarily in the United States and Canada, with groups including the Apache and Navajo in the American Southwest, and the Klingit in Alaska and British Columbia, and the Nadini peoples are easily distinguished from other Amerindians for belonging to a distinct haplogroup, C3b, which shows their common paternal descent from Northern Asians, while haplogroup Q originated further west. 
Are there any remnants of this group back in their original homeland? Well, as a matter of fact, there are. Although dwindling in number, the Yenisean people of Siberia are currently a linguistic isolate, although the most widely proposed theory regarding their connections to other language families is with the Nadini family of North America, with the Yenisians not quite being their progenitors, but rather being another branch of the original Proto-Amerindian peoples who split from the Nadini branch thousands of years ago. And this makes complete sense sense from an anthropological viewpoint, as the Yenisians have a very clear physical resemblance to these Amerindians, not only through facial structure, but also through their dress, customs, and culture. There is one last genetic oddity in the indigenous peoples of the America, however, that being the presence, in fact strong presence, of Western European haplogroup R1b in Amerindian peoples in the northwest corner of the US and Canada, reaching as high as 90% in some tribes. Now this find, coupled with the discovery of specific Stone Age tools and weapons found in the same region that bear a passing resemblance to the Solutrean culture of ancient Europe has led some historians to formulate the so-called Solutrean hypothesis, or the theory that ancient Western Europeans were the first to arrive and settle in the Americas by crossing the Atlantic, rather than the crossing of the Bering Strait by Siberians thousands of years later. Although there certainly are quirks regarding the genetics of these Northeast Amerindian peoples that point to a more unconventional theory for the populating of America, there are many holes regarding the Solutrean hypothesis or other alternative scenarios for the peopling of the Americas. Consider the fact that the modern European phenotype didn't even develop until around eight to 10,000 years ago, so it would make sense that if their descendants did mingle with the Eastern Eurasian inhabitants, that they would have little resemblance to the Europeans of today. Although so far, genetic studies have yet to corroborate claims of ancient Western Eurasian admixture through autosomal DNA testing. In addition to the presence of haplogroup R1b in large numbers in Native American tribes such as the Ojibwe, Cree, and other Algonquin peoples, it has also been discovered that haplogroup X, a maternal haplogroup also found in some Algonquin tribes, is also found in modern amounts in Europe and the Middle East, being the only two regions on the planet where this maternal haplogroup is found in large numbers. However, it must be noted that haplogroups X and R1b are not strictly associated with Western European peoples, as indeed the paternal clade is also found spread across the larger Eurasian landmass among Armenians, Turkic Central Asians such as the Altai and Bashkir, and even outside of Eurasia such as in the Chadic peoples of West Africa. Alternatively, many have argued that the high levels of R1b found in modern Amerindians is 100% the responsibility of post-15th century European colonialism, as indeed many Europeans, especially men but women as well, did intermarry into the Amerindian community early on in American history. The dominance of the R1b haplogroup in northwestern Amerindian groups has still continued to baffle anthropologists and has led to a frenzied debate, and although it is extremely difficult to determine the true degree of influence of the post-colonial European immigration wave on the Amerindian gene pool, there is no doubt that at least a portion of the R1b haplogroup found in the males of this region can be traced back to recent European migrants from the British Isles, or also equally likely France. As mentioned previously, in some tribes, R1b, the supposed European haplogroup, reaches rates up to 90%. Although the prospect of 90% of the male genetic lines of these tribes being European seems highly improbable. Compare this to Greenland, where around 40 to 50% of all Y-DNA haplogroups for so-called native Greenlandic Inuits are of confirmed recent European origin, giving the Inuits European admixture at a rate of around 25% on average. Something some apposite as a legacy from the much older Viking settlement on the island, although in reality is much more likely the result of more recent admixture introduced by Danish fishermen from after the collapse of the previous Norse colony. Colony. As haplogroup R is believed to have originated in Central Asia, the most realistic explanation is that this supposed R1b territory among northern Amerindians is merely a result of the founding population carrying this paternal haplogroup and spreading it on to their descendants, similar to how R1b is also dominant in northern Nigeria because of an early wave of Eurasian migrants. Similarly, haplogroup X has also been found in the region believed to be the nexus of the Proto-Amerindian population near the Altai Mountains in northern Asia, meaning that a small group of women from the region could also be responsible for this western Eurasian haplogroup.
Evidence suggests that early Proto-Amerindian peoples in Eurasia before migrating across the Bering Strait also had mixed Western Eurasian ancestry at rates up to 30%, similar to how Siberians and Central Asians today are also generally a result of miscegenation between Western and Eastern Eurasian peoples. This Amerindian and Greater Siberian group is believed to have split from East Asians such as the Chinese, Mongols, or Japanese sometime before, so this would explain why Amerindian do not have strictly Eastern Eurasian features, as clearly facial features are highly variable and quite unique, although they also share many genetic traits with Eastern Eurasians as well, such as low alcohol tolerance, certain hereditary diseases, and the presence of an epicanthic fold in many full-blooded Amerindians, especially the Inuit in the far north, who descend largely from later Asian migrants. However, this doesn't mean that Amerindians are strictly of Northeast Eurasian or Siberian origins, as recent genetic studies conducted on Amerindians in the Amazon region of Brazil, who for the most part have remained isolated for thousands of years, has concluded that a proportion of the original settlers of the Americas were of Oceanian or Pacific Islander ancestry traveling along the Asian coastline and intermingling with other Eurasian groups. Either way, this is certainly a very fascinating topic, and I encourage you all to do your own research on the Solutrean hypothesis and other peopling scenarios of the Americas, although it should be noted that I'm not an expert and although many credentialed anthropologists and historians have shared their belief in this theory, it only started to gain steam as of the last decade, and most experts reject an ancient Solutrean crossing of the Atlantic. Go ahead and answer today's poll and share your opinions in the comments, and I really do apologize for my absence as of the past couple months. I've been adjusting to a new schedule, but we should be on track soon. And as always, thank you all so much for watching. This has been Mason, and I'll see you next time.